All right, good morning. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm wound up. So uh, I don't think it was because I had too much coffee. Uh, I do think it might be because I decided not to watch all of the Astros game. And I recorded uh, the last inning to watch it this morning, <clears throat> which was a wonderful setup for me to come and to preach, you know, because, uh, and I, I don't know about you, but when I get nervous or I get, you know, just some anxiety comes, I start getting up and walking around and pacing. And so at 530 in the morning, I'm going through the house pacing, my chihuahuas are pacing. My wife is like, don't make noise, don't wake me up. And uh, so I don't know about you, but it was one of those difficult uh, uh, times watching, but the Astros won, didn't they? Yes. Okay. Yep, I'm, I'm happy also, but there's still some anxiety inside of me, just to let you know. The second thing is, one of the things that, that uh, I'll be honest with you, there's a little confession that I don't do well, is talk about the, the budget of the church and, uh, and, and, and the money that comes in, because you, you guys are amazing how faithful you are, how much you give. Somebody said, y'all don't talk about money very much, or ask people to give. I said, well, you know, actually, <clears throat> that's not true. We probably ask for money every Sunday. It's just usually somebody else's, you know, where it's going to someone else when we, when we ask for it. And you guys are just incredibly faithful. So during the month of October, we decided to do budget promotion. And it won't be like, like you might have been to church before and thought, I'm not going to stand up here and do a big guilt trip on you because that doesn't... Uh, work very well, first of all. And secondly, you guys give an amazing way. You support the church. Um, you recognize that just like any, just like your home, you've got to pay your bills. Uh, the better we do here, the better we do helping other groups and, and other, and it's true. If we don't do what we do here, there is no money that goes out and helps someone else because we don't have family gathered together to talk about it, uh, talk about other needs and other things coming up. In fact, I'll throw one out. I know I'm not supposed to do this, so get me for this one. But in a couple of weeks, we're headed to Latvia. <clears throat> and in Latvia is a teacher's conference. It's not exciting that much. It's not very sexy. Um, it's Latvia is a country that's gone through 10 or 15 years of really difficult uh, economic struggles. And so the whole teachers conference, there'll be 300 teachers, public school teachers who will show up. They pay a little bit, but they don't pay what the conference costs. And so if you want to give to help pay for what that conference costs, it's all about changing uh, a generation in a nation because we can teach those teachers about a relationship to Christ. They can go into their classrooms in Latvia and teach uh, from the Bible and Christianity, we, we get them Bibles, we teach them, we try to build them up because economically it's a struggle for public teachers in Latvia. They've taken two major pay cuts 
um, because of their economics. And so it, it, it affects then the next generation because how teachers can survive to do that. And so this is one of those things that uh, Peter Samolich came up with. We've been doing it three times a year for years and years and years. If you would like to contribute to that, uh, it's like I said, it's, it's not the most exciting thing in the world for a, for a lot of people, but it is incredibly effective. Every dollar you give to that really, really helps uh, those teachers. So there's my little plug, but I want to plug Family Life. Family Life is, our, is basically our children's area. It affects uh, parents. It affects really everything in the church for us because this is the future of the church. Um, this is your children, um, your future, my children, my future, and it, it may be the core foundation of almost everything we do in the church. Is if you look in here and you look through this, this tells all about it, the things that have been accomplished. Like this is just a phenomenal piece uh, that the, uh, some of the staff put together. And um, out of the church budget, almost or a little over three quarters of a million dollars goes toward uh, the family life area, the children's area. Now that includes buildings, electricity, uh, staff, salaries. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's just like anybody else. There are bills to pay. It's all the training, uh, all the materials, all the uh, extra uh, programs that are put on, uh, the ministry safe expenses that we have to train uh, not only staff but volunteers. Um, all this stuff go, has to be paid for and all of it goes into affecting your kids so that we can teach them about who God is, uh, who Jesus is, uh, what the Bible says, and all the, the foundational things that go into your kids, as well as, uh, as parents who are parenting those kids, because we're trying to partner with and support all of those partners. I hope you'll take a look at this, and, uh, and it's uh, a way of also of us saying uh, thank you for your giving and your uh, faithfulness. Now I want to talk about um, emotional baggage. We started this last week. In fact, if you were here last week, uh, you remember last week's title was, anybody remember last week's title? It was what? Everyone what? Oh, carries. Thank you. Okay. Somebody pulled out their whole outline. Everyone, everyone carries. There are open carriers and there are concealed carriers, right? But we all have emotions that we, that we carry. And I told you that I carry and I brought my luggage out. Here was my bag. I rolled it out and uh, told a few stories about it. And so I decided to bring it back, but it's a little bit different this week uh, in my bag, because if, if you were up here, you'd say, wow, that bag's a lot heavier than it was before. It is because there are things in the bag and uh, they're, they're meant to be there as an illustration because a lot of times what people see and what you might see you know, on the outside of me are um, certain emotions. Maybe you're around people that are angry all the time. Maybe you're around somebody who's defensive, right? You know, that's, that's part of that emotion. Maybe you're around someone or maybe you're one of those people that you just feel kind of, you know, timid and beat down. And that's the emotion that you, that you, that you show all the time. There are other emotions. Some people cover the outside part of their life is confidence. Some people joke all the time. I'm like that. I like to be funny. I, like, I think it kind of breaks the ice and I'll make fun of all kinds of things. Some people are very serious on the outside. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about um, me. Um, raised in a small town, um, was, was uh, always the kid, in fact, my wife knows this, and, and the adult that felt like, what is it about me? I, it, it felt like I could be spotted a mile away by a person who was going to con somebody. And it felt like they could spot me in a crowd. What is it? Is it, is it the fact my hair used to be bright red? Is it the way I walk? Is there something about me I don't understand why I'm so easy to spot? And so uh, one of the things I would do with my kids as they were little and they were growing up is I tried to teach them not to look like such an easy mark. I did. I said, you need to walk with a little scowl on your face, you know, like don't come near me, right? That's one of those outward emotions. And, you know, you don't want to mess with me. In fact, I, I would teach my kids, I would walk them down the street and I'd teach them how to walk with a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of Bregman in them, right? You know, a little attitude, you know, a little chip on their shoulder. You don't know if you're watching the game, you do, that he was, he was the number two draft choice in the draft, which is why he wears the number two. He wants to remind himself, it's a chip on his shoulder, that he was picked number two, not number one, and he wants to be number one. And I, I, I did these things because I thought, there's something, I came from a small town, I look naive, I, I don't know what it is. But 
over time, that has changed. And let me tell you, the change is both good and, and at the same time, it's not good. Sometimes now I get picked out and I'll ask my wife, why did I get picked out? We were just somewhere this week in a group of people and the guy that was the guy, very loud, very aggressive. Um, I mean, he was just in your face. And of all the things, he picks me out of the group. And I'm like, why would he pick me out of the group? And I'm the only one that he takes out of the group. And he asks, what do you do for a living? I go, you don't really want to, you know. <laughs> and and it, didn't, it didn't bother him that much, what I did for a living, when I told him. But I, was, I told my wife again, I said, why is it, why do I get picked out now for this? And so here's what she said. She said, because you have an heir, and this is, this is something that has come over time, not, not trying to brag or what, you have an air of confidence about you. Now, listen, let me explain something to you. That is because of what I do for a living. That's because I stand up in front of you and I, and I, I talk about things that I think are important to talk about. And for me, they have to be real. Um, I try to be as genuine as I can be because if it's not, it, to me, it just, it doesn't matter. It's just a speech then. And, and so this is something that I have learned over time. This is something that I do for a living. So because of that, when I go places or go in groups, it just doesn't bother me, um, you know, to be there. And it doesn't bother me to interact with people, not because it's some, you know, wonderful spiritual gift that I have. It's just, it's just what I do for a living. And, and that's sort of changed things. Now, let me also tell you, that's not always a good thing. It's not because in the outside, you can carry with you a sense of confidence and never deal with the things on the, on the inside that you have to deal with. And you can appear to be, everything is okay. I've got everything under control. There can be an outward confidence that we all strive for and we'd all would like that can actually be a detriment to you. It can hurt you. Because then you say, I don't have to deal with these things um, that are on the inside. Anybody ever done um, Toastmasters? You know, are you going to a class or maybe at work and they've got you up in front of people and trying to, to teach you to overcome the fear of what? Public speaking. Anybody ever done that? Anybody really have a fear of public speaking? Come up here. No, no, okay, I'm sorry. I would, okay. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that too. Well, yeah, I might. Okay, but I, I won't do it. I won't do it today. Everybody, have, you know, but you have a fear of public speaking. Here, here's what, it, it, Toastmasters is a really good thing, and there are other organizations that do this. You get up, you speak, you have to get up, you have to kind of deal with your fears, with your struggles, and then over, over time, you, you know, you kind of help conquer those or you get over them somewhat. So here's what you learn if you do Toastmasters and you get over the fear of public speaking. Here's what you gain out of it, which is amazing. You learn, you gain the ability to get over the fear of public speaking. You're like, well, duh. Yes, that's all it is. <laughs> it didn't change anything on the what? On the inside. It didn't. It changed on the outside, and it can fool you into thinking that everything's okay on the inside. There are a lot of things that can do that. If, if you're very attractive and people like you, you can say, well, everything must be okay. You just, like I said, have this sense of confidence. You look like everything's okay. Everything must be okay. When a lot of times everything's not okay on the inside. Or maybe you, you're very successful, very driven. I've been around a lot of successful and driven people. In fact, they, they, they really kind of amaze me being around them because the more that you're around them, what you find out as you get to know them is the same struggles that you have on the inside. Guess what? They've got them too. And sometimes... Their success actually is a detriment to them. Listen, it is. Because you can go through life not dealing with the stuff on the inside that you have to deal with on the inside, that if you don't deal with it in this life on the inside, that stuff is still there. It still hangs around. And the reason I say that is because I, I can't walk around and think just because it, I'm not afraid to stand up and to speak in front of other people, that that means everything is okay on the inside, because it's not. It still has to be dealt with on the inside. I uh, brought my bag. It's a little heavier today because this is the way bags really are. And uh, I wanted to show you uh, something in 
in my bag that the reason it's heavier is because, I better turn it this way, because there's stuff on the inside that we all carry. Here we go. There we go. There's baggage on the inside, right? Guilt. Guilt is one of those things on the inside that you carry with you, but you don't, you don't carry it on the outside unless other people happen to find out that you're guilty of something. And then they may point it out, but even if they point it out, what you're going to do is you're going to hide it inside of something. You may hide it inside of uh, anger, you may defensiveness, you may hide it inside of confidence, or you may dress it up really well so everything looks okay. And I'm just feeling this and realize the price tag is still on guilt. Yeah, because it still has a price, but there's actually even more that you hide than just your guilt. Your guilt is when, you know, you're, you're caught doing something you shouldn't have done. You're guilty. But it, it's usually an event, something, you know, that you do. There, there's even more. In fact, there is a bag even within the bag. And when I picked this up, I didn't even realize there was a bag within the bag. And a receipt <laughs> from the uh, bag within the bag. <laughs> Better save that one, because I'm taking this back as soon as I, okay, no. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but there is a bag within the bag. And it's not just guilt. You know what this one is? Shame. Because guilt says something about what you did and you did the wrong thing, whether you got caught or not. Shame says something about who you are. Shame says, I'm not a good person. Shame says, no matter what happens, if I get caught, I don't get caught. Inside, I don't want anyone to see what's inside the bag inside the bag because this says something about me and this is the most difficult thing of all to get over to get past who's going to fix this I love uh, stuff like Toastmasters I love trying to help people feel confident in life but confidence or success or um, acclamations that come your way None of those things conquer shame. They just mask it. You just stuff it down. It just, it just hides somewhere, but it's still there. And at some point in life, you recognize it's still there. No one has ever dealt with it. Who's going to get to it and deal with it? In fact, this is the whole point of Christianity. This is the whole point of what Jesus came to do. He didn't come just to make you successful. Jesus didn't come, you know, so that you'd be pretty. Sorry. He didn't come so you could stand up and talk in front of people. Those may be things you accomplish and do. They're wonderful. But Jesus actually came to do a whole lot more than that. He came to deal with the stuff inside that no one else and nothing else deals with. And you can go to all sorts of self-help and things like that, but they are not going to deal with it. And the reason they're not going to deal with it is that they can't deal with it. They don't have the ability to deal with who you are and the shame that you carry deep inside. I don't know if you realize this, but shame and guilt, especially shame, are associated in psychology and in uh, those who do social work. They, they find that they're, they're closely tied to anger, to violence. They're closely tied to addictions. They're closely tied to depression. It's closely tied to bullying and, and, and uh, being aggressive in, in, in a negative way, in a very destructive way. It's, it's, it's just science. It's just been proven because somehow you're trying to hide and overcome and, and cover this that's on the inside. So now I want to take you to a, a story. A passage in, a, in the Bible, because the truth is, this is what Jesus came to deal with. And I want to take you to the gospel of Mark. And uh, Mark is the second, second gospel in the New Testament. Uh, you have Matthew, then Mark, and uh, Mark is the shortest one. Um, Mark jumps right into the actions that Jesus did, the things that he did to show what those things meant and how powerful those things uh, were. I, I'm, I'm going to help you because this, this is really important stuff, but, but it can also, if you're not careful, it can cause you to miss the most important stuff that Jesus' actions 
uh, actually tried to reveal or to disclose to people because Jesus did a lot of things, a lot of wonderful things. So Mark jumps in, even in the first chapter, very quickly with the, uh, the actions of Jesus. Jesus is calling out uh, some disciples, and those disciples are following him. And this is how it picks up in uh, chapter 1. This is... Uh, Matthew chapter 1, I'm going to read pretty fast, so hang on to your seat. If you have a Bible with you, you might want to turn to Mark chapter 1. Verse number 40 says this, and a leper came to Jesus. Now, let me stop right there. In, in their day, if you had leprosy, your life was over. Because on the outside, some, when people would see you, they'd say, don't get near him or her. Don't, you don't want anything to do with them. This is contagious they, they were those who were pushed outside. In, in fact, in some cities, by law, if you had leprosy, you had to wear bells <laughs> so people could hear you coming, so they could clear the street, right? So they could run, so they could gather their children and say, don't, you don't want to get near that person. That person has leprosy. Now, it's one of those things that today, um, they can actually cure leprosy. I don't know if you realize that. And, uh, but it still carries this incredible Stigma. In fact, I know a man, I've known him for a long time, and he had leprosy. He, from Louisiana, I'm not correlating, but <laughs> where he grew up, there was, there was leprosy. He had leprosy. He was cured of leprosy. And one of the things he would, would say when we, we would talk about this is, yes, but I don't ever tell anybody I ever had leprosy. He said, I tell you, but I don't tell anybody else. And so I'm telling you, but I'm not telling you who he is. Because he said, no, people would avoid me. They would. They don't understand it. They don't know what it means. They don't realize it can be cured. It can be wiped out now. But it, he said, if they were to hear, so I can't ever tell anyone that I once had it. That, that's because of this stigma that was there. And this guy, if, if you had leprosy in his day, you absolutely, on the outside, you would say, my life is over. There's no hope. It, because it didn't just say something about who you were or what you did. And in their day, in the Old Testament, they absolutely attributed, if you had leprosy, to sin in your life. But it was attributed to your identity, not just what you did, if you're guilty or not. This is who you are. And you carried this shame with you your entire life. So here's a guy who had leprosy. It says that he came to Jesus beseeching him because immediately Mark is into the things that Jesus was doing that revealed who he was. And falling on his knees before him, saying, if you are willing, he's talking to Jesus, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and, and catch this, and he did what? He, yeah, he touched him. Nobody else touched him. In fact, you know, people jumped back when Jesus touched him and said, oh, I don't want to shake his hand now, you know, because that, that's a dangerous thing. He touched him and he said, I am willing be cleansed. And then look at this. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he, this is Jesus, sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. He said to him, here's what he warned him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Not because of the leprosy. It's because Jesus was not ready to be fully revealed as, as who he was. He said, and show yourself to the priests and offer your clean." Uh, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Verse 45 says, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and spread the news around. In other words, he did the opposite of what Jesus said. He's running around telling everybody, I used to have leprosy. You remember me? And I've been cleansed. And this is the guy that did it to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were, count, they were coming to him from everywhere. Now, the Bible is full of all this wonderful language. And just to let you know, when it says, and they were coming to him from everywhere, it doesn't mean everywhere. This is, this is the, the Bible is full of literary things in there. This is hyperbole. It meant to them living in this area, it looked like people were coming from all over the world to see Jesus. But of course, as you might understand, it meant as the word spread from where Jesus was, people who heard and as the word spread further were coming from those places to see Jesus so that it was overwhelming. They didn't have, you know, news stations and satellites and all that to be able to monitor the world. So to them, the world was just right where they were. And it was absolutely 
overwhelming. The, the Bible is, um, these books, there were no chapter and verses, so it's just a continuous letter. So here's what it says in the very next verse, and this is the one I want to get to. This is verse number one of chapter two. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Now let me again, let me, let me explain to you. Jesus is, uh, lived and was born and raised in Nazareth, of uh, the area called uh, Galilee. And uh, that is to the west of the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth was Jesus' new adopted, I mean Capernaum, new adopted home. It was north of the Sea of Galilee. This was the place, and you'll see it in chapter one, Mark will tell you about it, where Jesus uh, calls out Simon and Andrew, two brothers. Simon is Simon Peter. And he calls them out to follow him, and they were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. And so more than likely, this story takes place. It doesn't say uh, for sure, but this is just what everything else in all the Gospels uh, suggests. This was Jesus' new home base. This is where when he came back, he would come back to uh, their home, the home of uh, Andrew and Simon Peter. And there were, um, John and James were from there. I think Matthew, the tax collector, was from the same area. So this is kind of Jesus' new center of operation. So he comes back home. Everyone hears all these stories of what he is doing, and they're coming to see him. They're not coming to see him for any spiritual reason. They're coming to see him because of what? What? Anybody? He healed people. <laughs> The blind could see, the lame could walk, the diseased were cured. Now, did Jesus heal everyone who had an illness? Or, no, he did not. In fact, the Bible is actually really clear about this because this was, a, this was a sign to people. This was the outside of the bag. This is He's dealing with the physical um, body of who they are. Is it important? Oh, my goodness, it's important because as they would say, no one as far as we've known in the history, can do things like this, the, the outside. But Jesus actually comes to deal with more than just the outside. He comes to deal with what? The inside, the guilt, the shame that's on the inside. To bring a healing in here that no one else necessarily sees in your life and in my life, but they do see evidences of it. They do see a sense of healing that occurs when this is taken uh, care of in your life. They see a new you know, joy in your life. They see a new peace in your life. They see new meaning and purpose in your life because you're a person that, that God has come in through Jesus and has dealt with what's on the inside. This is incredible. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. Does it affect the outside? Sure it does. Because all the baggage on the outside that you had to carry with you to protect the inside all of a sudden becomes less and less important. It doesn't matter as much because he's done something on the inside of you. Does that make sense? That's exactly who Jesus was and what he came to do. And a lot of people don't get it. A lot of people in their day didn't get it. They saw what Jesus did. They came running to him. What they wanted was, I want you to heal. I have acne. You know, I need you to heal my acne. And uh, that's supposed to be funny. Like I told you, I do that every once in a while. You know, I, that's what they understood. And Jesus did these things so that you would understand that Jesus can do things on the inside that no one sees, but they see, you know, outside reactions to the things that he does on the inside of you. And listen, the things on the inside are the most important. Because you can cover them, but covering them doesn't heal them. It doesn't, it doesn't fix them. So in Old Testament days, they absolutely associated sin and illness, sin and infirmity. And so in the Old Testament days, you, you could not be healed of anything on the outside. This is the, how they saw it. You may not see it this way. They saw it this way. You could not be healed of anything on the outside unless you were forgiven of your guilt and your shame on the inside. That's how they saw it. That's how they understood it. So this wasn't just some new medical breakthrough. This was something that they realized was, was occurring and it has never occurred before. And this means something that we've never understood before. Oh, incidentally, as we read this story, let me tell you this. For the Old Testament um, scholars and Pharisees and religious leaders, 
They did not see the Messiah in the Old Testament as, as coming to forgive sins. They didn't. That was not how they associated. Messiah was a leader to overcome things on the outside. That's why these outside things were so attractive to them. Every Messiah that you read about in Israel and in Jerusalem, uh, we have a new Messiah, always came in, in Jesus' day to conquer Rome. And they were always viewed as flawed uh, messiahs, flawed people with their own sins and their own faults, but they came to free the people from the outside thing. Jesus is different. Jesus is a, is a bigger expression of, of who God is. He, he's, a, he's an enormous manifestation of who God is compared to how they saw it and how they understood it. This is God revealing himself, not through the prophet's uh, of the Old Testament, now through his own son who comes to rescue us. And I hope you catch this because if you don't, you don't understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is capable of doing in your life, what, what he came to do in your life. So here, let me go back to this story. Okay, so when Jesus uh, returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he had come back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed um, with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their, say it with me, seeing their what? Their faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, in some of your translations it will say son. That's because Jesus used the word of endearment with him. He says, my child, your sins are what? Forgiven. Oh, so, you know, I, I kind of do it like the metal arc uh, lemon thing in the old globe trotters. But it's my leg. You know, it's not, it's not my sins. It's not what I'm looking for. They, they did all this. They tore a hole in the roof. They tied probably fishing ropes and things up on the roof because, like I said, remember, this was the home of uh, some fishermen. Um, and, they, and they used those. And all of a sudden, in the midst of a crowd, you know, the room was not, not as big as, as this. There wouldn't have been this many people, you know, in the room. But in the room and outside the door, it's just packed. You can't get in there. And all of a sudden, they're lowering this man down. And Jesus looks at him and says in an endearing way, son, my son, your sins are forgiven. Because he recognized the faith of the four who are doing anything they have to do to get this man to Jesus. And, and, and I, I see, I, I think the man is sitting there in awe of who Jesus is. Because I don't think Jesus had any problem speaking to people. But there's something so much more about who Jesus is than just his, his presence or his ability to deal with people. There's something powerful about this man. He's heard all the stories, so of his friends. And so his expectation is something different than what is offered. But for the religious leaders who were also in the room, because they were amazed at this man too, because he could do things they could not do. Listen, Jesus can do things I cannot do. Jesus could do things no man that lives on this earth today could do. It's because of who he was. And, he, and he, they were all coming because they were, they were like, what is going on with this man? Who is this man? Why is he able to do these things? Because they associated the two together. But when Jesus says these words, your sins are forgiven, oof. For them, cross the line. Can't do that. Even though, like I said, for them... To heal somebody physically is impossible if their sins are not forgiven. That's how they viewed it. So it had to be, but at the same time, they looked at it and it says, but, but you've, you've crossed the line. Look at the next verse. Here's verse number uh, five or number six. It says, but some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only, say this with me, only God can forgive sins. No man can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Now it says Jesus immediately knew what they were thinking. He understood. And Jesus doesn't, you know, uh, um, try to refute it in that sense of saying, oh, yes, you know, I can or whatever. Instead, look at what he does. He says, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, 
Your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Let me ask you a question. Which one do you think is easier? <laughs> think it's easier to say it to a person, your sins are forgiven? Or is it easier to say to someone who has never been able to walk, who is lame, stand up and walk? It's a good question, isn't it? Because in one sense, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. How are you going to test it? <laughs> you can go ahead and make all sorts of claims, you know, about people. How, how would you know? But like I said, they associated the two together. You could not separate the two. And so Jesus is taking what they naturally associate together. Okay, your sins are forgiven. But that's not my issue. That's not my problem. That's not my struggle. Okay, so which is easier? In, in one sense, you would say, stand up and walk. Because medically, let's, let's be honest, medically, we can cause people to walk today that in, his, in their day, they couldn't cause to walk. Just like I said, medically, you can cure leprosy or certain uh, versions of it. They, they couldn't do that back then. So, so which is easier? In, in one sense, you would say, well, in one sense, that might be easier. But to deal with this in someone's life, to get deep inside of someone and help them with not just covering their guilt and, and their shame, but I'm talking about dealing with their guilt and their shame that they carry with them and that they build all of these big outside bags to cover and to ward off people or to act like it's not really a problem in my life. Which one's easier to deal with? So Jesus says this, so that you would know. Or, or is in New Living, he says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive, forgive sins. So it, it's this idea that, but just so you'll understand what I'm saying is true, the part that you, that you can't see. Then he turned to the paralyzed man and he said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. Jesus actually physically heals the man. Is it important? Oh my goodness. Of course it's important. This is the part the Pharisees dare not challenge him on. They can't do that. They might say something like, hey, you're, you know, God has forgiven your sins. They can't look at a man and say, stand up and walk. And since the two are associated together, Jesus is saying, yes, you, you cannot heal without healing on the inside. And to show you that I can heal on the inside, watch this, stand up and walk. Um, I, I, I put in here, this is a quote from um, Rebecca McLaughlin, uh, her book, uh, Confronting Christianity, it's in, your, it's in your outline. It's a really good book. It's come out this year. And she talks about the importance of the physical things that happen in Christianity, how important they are. In fact, here's what she says. She says, the central truth claim on which Christianity, look at this, stands or falls is that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. She is absolutely right. That's what started this movement. Jesus physically was raised from the dead. There's a historical evidence for this claim, outrageous as it may seem. Alternative th theories are surprisingly unpersuasive. And in her book, I think it's chapter number six, she actually goes through those theories if you want to pick up her book. And the extraordinary phenomena of the early church erupting from a small group of dispirited and cowardly followers, just read the gospels, you'll see that, of a crucified rabbi cries out for a what? An ignition, say it with me. Something had to spark it. Something had to cause it. In this case, something had to cause them to understand and begin to catch it. It works for you and me also. What is it that will spark the understanding that you have that if Jesus says your sins are forgiven, that your sins are forgiven. What is it? What will it take? See, Jesus came to do those things. Rise from the dead. Heal people of their infirmities. To spark something so that you would realize he can do for you something he did for those 2,000 years ago, something he's been doing in, in people all over the world and continues to do in people all over the world. You go to China, you go to Africa, it's usually the places that are more desperate and desolate and, and the gospel spreads enormously. And let me also tell you, you go to those places, you'll see things you don't see here happen so that he can verify 
for them what the claims are. That this is a man that can take away your guilt and your shame. Can heal on the inside. So because of that, he goes and he heals on the outside to prove also who he is. It says in the very next uh, verse, I think it'll pop up on the screen there. It says, and the man jumped up. He grabbed his mat. He walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never, say it with me, we have never seen. <laughs> what what do you, can you say? We have never seen anything like this. Paul does this amazing thing. Paul gives us this verse. It's in Romans chapter 7, and Paul is a man who's, whose life is radically transformed by who Jesus Christ is. And if you want to go read a, a really um, a good chapter in Romans, Romans chapter 7, second half, Paul talks about his own sin and his own struggles and this that lives inside of him. And he says this about himself. He says, wretched man that I am, because he's looking at his own sin. This is not unconverted Paul. This is Paul as, as the elder statesman as, as years and years later, and he's looking at himself. Who, who will cure me? Who will heal me? Who will fix me on the inside? And he says at the end of chapter 7, it's Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, it's Jesus Christ. Then he says this. Remember, Romans the same way. No chapters and divisions. This is part of a letter. Then he says in this in uh, verse number 1 and 2. In fact, it'll pop up on the screen. I, I would encourage you to memorize these verses because these are radical verses. Look at what he says. He says, therefore, that means because of this, Therefore, there is now no, say it with me, no what? That's this stuff. There's no guilt. And sh the guilt and shame has been taken care of. There's now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in who? Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is radical. Paul, how could you make statements like that? How can you say that the condemnation for your guilt, your sins, the condemnation for who you are, your shame, that, that you're flawed, you're not enough, you, 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 you know it's in there. How can you say that's been taken away? He says, because of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Christ came to do. He healed on the outside to show that the promises he made and the, and the healing that he brings on the inside is real. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Here's what I want you to do. Um, you, can, you can pray as this comes out, but what I really want you to do is as, we, uh, as this passes, I want you to listen to the, uh, to the words of uh, the song that we're singing. And I want you to contemplate, just for a minute, where you are. What's going on in your life? How, how you see it and how you understand it. Because what Jesus did was so important, and, and it was a reminder to all those people around, um, around him and that came afterwards not to forget who he was and what he did. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You know our needs. You know our struggles. Uh, you've come to heal the things that we can't heal, fix the things that we could, we could never fix, we could never do away with. Lord, the things that we usually cover up, that we pretend are not really there, we don't want anyone to know because we're embarrassed, makes us feel less of a person, empty, not, not whole, unwanted, not wanted. In fact, for many of us, we would admit that it makes us angry, causes us to, to stay attached to things and even addicted to things, trying to find something to fill us up, to overcome this, this feeling inside that we've not found anyone who is able to take it away. But Lord, we thank you that you sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus didn't come just to make us feel a little bit better. He came to heal us, to fix us, change us on the inside. Not only to deal with our guilt, but to deal with deep down the shame that we carry with us as he took it upon himself. Thank you, Lord, that 
<clears throat> we're not perfect. We're a mess. We all are. We try to cover it. Try to act like it's not there, but we all are. But our answer is not found in ourselves. It's found in Jesus himself. 